Good afternoon, and welcome to the third in a series of PV published authors. We welcome those in the audience today, as well as our authors that are um, seated uh, with me. Um, this week, we are recognizing authors from the June and Samuel Brailsford College of Arts and Sciences. Um, the College of Arts and Sciences is home for nine departments and one division, offering courses that lead to bachelor's degrees in 13 different disciplines, four masters, and one doctorate. Um, we are pleased that our host today, KPVU-TV, is also a member of the College of Arts and Sciences. Our guests today are Dr. Ronald Goodwin, uh, associate professor in the area of social sciences and serving as department chair. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Dr. William Holston, professor of political science and is the director of the Mellon, uh, uh, Insta Mellon Center for Faculty Excellence and Dr. Ali Akbar Hagigi, former chair of the mathematics department, professor of mathematics, um, he also is the founder, uh, the chief founder, the editor-in-chief of Application and Applied Mathematics, an international journal. The three individuals will share um, their journey in publishing the manuscripts that you see on the table before us. We'll have some conversations. If you have questions, we invite you to put those questions in the chat. Those of you in the audience will have an opportunity also to ask questions as we move through. Um, we may start with Dr. Goodwin to share his story of, sure. of his sure. manuscript, um, how his journey led him to um, publish this uh, manuscript, and maybe some advice for those of you that are listening that are interested in publishing in the, in the future. Thank you. Um, the journey for this book was was pretty, I guess I'd say different, because when I went to the archives initially, I wasn't looking for information on the New Deal in Texas. But I came across some information, the, uh, particularly the, the slave narratives. And I started reading as you're going through data and information, sometimes you catch, you find something that catches your eye. And so I stopped and I started reading something. And two hours later, I found that I was still, still reading this material. And I thought, this is, is just blowing my mind because some of the information had not been published before. Uh, a lot of the material on, on the slave narratives and on the WPA projects in Texas um, were not widely available and widely known to students or, or the academy. Uh, the history of the New Deal was, um, this was FDR's initiative to pull the country out of the Great Depression. Um, so he started all these initiatives designed to provide employment for those who were unemployed. And some of the projects were criticized at the time as work that was really of no value. So once World War II begins, and then the US involvement escalates after 1941, some of the materials were thrown in the river wow. um, because they felt they needed space. So a lot of, a lot of records that were in Texas were, were sent to Washington, D.C., but some were not sent, and they were still housed here. So as I began looking through some of the materials and the records and, and the different programs, I was fascinated by... Um, the involvement, and in some cases, lack of involvement of the black community in Texas. So for the black community in Texas, dealing with the economic crisis of the depression was just another layer on top of Jim Crow segregation that was already devastating for most communities. So I wanted to see how, what happened and what, how did this community survive? And what are some of the things that came out of the community? And um, 
there were a lot of oral interviews, not just of former slaves, but of other individuals, cowboys and, and the like, in some of these programs. But you began to see how the black community in Texas were able to survive this devastation um, by working hard and trying to stay under the radar. And that is of the, of the, of the, of the racism that did exist in the state at that time. And we could argue still ever present <laughs> in our day to day lives. So do you see post COVID um, being something that may be reflective of, of what you researched before? Um, um, and I ask that because I know you can go in restaurants now and you will see empty seats and they will tell you we don't have space. Work. And it's because they don't have anybody to work in the restaurants. They don't have enough, not that they don't have anybody, but they'll have half of the restaurant closed off because they say that there's nobody that wants to work. Um, I think we see more of that post COVID. I'm not sure why. Um, well, I, it's you know, they said the free money is gone, but yeah. people are still. So I, I think we have a generation of folks in Texas who have grown up in an age of plenty. In more than enough. More than enough. And the thought of, of serving someone in a restaurant uh, may be uh, beneath their desired station in life. True. True. Whereas in the 1930s, folks fed families as dishwashers. That's true. Um, look, in the 1960s, folks fed families as dishwashers. But we have a generation of folks who've grown up not knowing Growing up with plenty, and, so and they're not. I, they're yeah. not. They'd rather say, "I'm not going to do that," than roll up their sleeves and get busy. And we hear the word more and more enough. Um, maybe I have enough. Um, maybe um, what you think I need more. Maybe I really don't. Um, maybe um, there was a show earlier last week with Michelle Obama, and she was talking about the fact of how she grew up. Um, her dad being um, disabled, um, they never owned a home, but they always had enough. And I think there are more people now that maybe they're saying, um, I do have enough, even though you may not think it, but maybe I do. That's possible. Yeah. Um, if that's the case, then we need to rethink some of the infrastructure and the facilities because we've built restaurants, we've built schools for a certain number. True. And maybe we won't ever have that number again. So now we have excess capacity. And that's something that our, uh, our leadership, social, political leadership, will have to contend with. So are you using your book um, in your classes? Not this semester. I've used, I've used chapters and okay. pieces of it, but not, not in its entirety. Because I find that we have a generation that really doesn't... Um, they're not as familiar with maybe their past right. um, as we would like for them to be because right. we know that as we move forward, we really know, need to know what happened before. Right. Um, so that would be... I, th I think part of, part of our society, uh, to be educated in our society means being able to have what I call that Starbucks conversation. Exactly. Where you're just, we're just you know, enjoying a beverage or whatever. We're just talking about the relationship between something now, something before, just having an intelligent conversation. And for somebody to sit there and say, oh, well, you know, um, I didn't know George Washington was in the Civil War. And then folks are gonna look at you like, where'd you go to school? And, and that's, that's what I, I don't want. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't want I always tell, tell my students, um, I like to be holistic about their education. Um, I would like to know that when they go out for an interview, um, even though we hope that we train them well in mathematics, uh, that they could sit at a dinner table and talk about 
uh, piece of work in the National Gallery, right. um, you know, Salvador Dali or something like that, that they, they recognize and they have that and they're able to, you know, put that conversation out there. So I do think it's, it's right. a good idea. It's so important. I'm, I'm to other guests, <laughs> I'm, I'm hosting is sitting here. I know he, <laughs> he the, wants to open his mouth. So <laughs> the American dream is so fluid. Okay. So in that respect, what you and I perceive to be the American dream may be vastly different from what a younger generation may perceive to be the true. American dream. True. How do you reconcile that in the minds of a young person when they are inundated by social media that tells them unless they obtain this, this right. is the American dream, right. whereas you and I may see the American dream in a totally different lens? How right. do you reconcile these two worlds? But you know, I'm okay with that. But there are certain things that are, that are consistent. Your integrity is, is consistent. You know, you have to have goals. Whatever it is that you want to do that you have talent to do, do that. But do that in such a way that you still bring honor to your family name and the people that you value, the people that are praying for you, whatever that may be. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm concerned that the idea of integrity and doing the thing that you said you would do is slipping, you know? One of the first things I ask students when they come into my class is, why are you here? Why are you here? Are you here because somebody said you got to get out of the house or you either do this or you do that or, you know, you think that's free money or, you know, you, you want to socialize? But all that is not why you're here, especially you know, at Prairie View, considering our history and, and that this was built on a plantation where folks worked this land who could have never dreamt of sitting in an air-conditioned classroom and getting an education. I'm you're taking that for granted? I'm here because mom and daddy told me. That well, <laughs> then you, you, they, they need to explain why it's why? important then. I'm here because I want to get an education, but I don't want to go to class. Well, then, okay. <laughs> Then keep, I'm here keep for looking you to, at your phone. I'm here and for you I won't to tell you. me what's the fastest way I can achieve the American dream. Okay. Then we're we're gonna have to have another conversation. I agree. <laughs> because and, and that's what I that's what I, you know. Because we're not regardless of what you think that dream is or what your dream is, that's fine. But you don't have a real understanding of why you're here. Why did you name the subtitle of the book? Uh, saving the past through hardship and turmoil. Put that right there. So uh, put that right there. Why did you name the, the subtitle that? Because I really like that subtitle. Yeah. Um, what, what made you go in that direction? I wanted to highlight the idea that uh, our past is, is, is slipping away and that our memories are slipping away. We, we are part of a community where oral traditions are not always fluid. Um, I, I, you know, within my own family, <laughs> um, people don't always tell the story. So have a story. Um, before my wife and I married, we, we were just engaged and I took her to meet my great grandmother, my mother's grandmother. And um, she was still moving around, and for some, you know, she brought out a photo album for my wife to see. And my mother is across the room, and I see her looking like, and I said, so what's wrong? She said, I've never seen that photo album. I, I don't know. So she's trying to kind of look over the shoulder and see what's in it. And so my wife, being polite, and she comes across a photo and says, this is interesting. Who's this? He doesn't look like he belongs with the other folks. His complexion was a little too light. <laughs> so my, my, my great-grandmother was in the kitchen, and she swung her head around. She said, baby, let me see that. She walked over. You know, She looked at that photo. I said, oh, OK. And got in a walk and walked away. Okay. Now, everybody's looking. You know, Did you offend? Was there? My mother like, We'll never see that photo album again. <laughs> Whoever was in that picture, she didn't want to talk about. 
And there are many things in our history, family, folks don't want to talk about. Then those memories are lost. And sometimes forever. Because folks will pass on and we'll never know. The yeah. photo will still be there. Yeah. But we, you know, what's the story behind it? It's things like medical history of our families generations yes. ago. I went through um, genetic testing when I was going through chemo, and I had to list three generations at least back. And when I started asking my mother, who was one of 11, um, you know, why did this sibling die? How old they were? It was like, you know, lips were closed. Like, why do you want to know that? Why do you want to know that? And the interesting thing is my mother's grandmother was Jewish. And so the nurse is asking me, that's doing the testing, that's sending it off, what line? I'm like, I don't know. What does that mean? What does that mean? Yeah. And she said, well, there's one line that's more prevalent, you know, than others for this cancer. My mother was not wanting to talk about it. Um, I don't know, and like you said, that picture, you know, whether it's an embarrassment, um, but they're very, there's a generation that's very tight-lipped, but it's very important for us, for our children, our grandchildren, to know those things or, or to know where that, you know, where it fits into our history. So um, have you seen that picture yet? No. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't you know, serve us it, it, it has not. Uh, I think that's it's gone. It's a closed conversation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So That's unfortunate too. It I is. Mean, and it's, it is very every family had. I think every family. It's very unfortunate. Yeah. Because every family, I mean, families are the same. There's there's some things that happen that, you know, it's not talked about or you know, so And I don't think it's you know, I think most races is it's not any different probably no. for us. Um but yeah, so that's unfortunate. But the levels levels of embarrassment and shame uh, you know, it's just it's just there. So I wanted to go back and try to capture some of that. And the discussion about the slave narratives, um, when I talked about that, I wanted the readers to understand that um, this is your family. These, this this right. could be your great, 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 great grandfather talking about their great, great grandfather and their experiences. So look at it as if you're sitting down and having a conversation. And I tried to write it in such a way that it, it, it became very conversational and not as, as academic as what we are accustomed to in the academy. So, so when you teach and you're using that, let me know so I can enroll in the class. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. Will do. We're gonna shift um, disciplines a little bit, uh, Dr. Hagigi. Oh. Oh. Um, and, you know, uh, the math department is, is, is my first love in my home. And uh, I always have always seen Dr. Higgy, Dr. Higgy from morning to night uh, on that computer doing his manuscripts. Um, and when he decided to do the journal, I remember it was uh, a task, but um, it has come full, full force. And, That's um, 18 years now. 18 years. So. Tell us a little bit about um, the journal and about uh, your book. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I uh, appreciate it. And I enjoyed your talk. Oh. Uh, I had a question, but I keep it for after. <laughs> <laughs> uh, essentially, you know, this is my 55th year of this, in this business, in wow. academia, 55 mm -hmm. years. So uh, <clears throat> during the years of teaching, <clears throat> and research, talking to students, uh, it was the same question that you raised. Why am I in this class? Why this course is good for me? What is formula good for, and so forth. Those days that I was younger, I did not have too much to answer, actually. And I had to just say something so that I could finish the talk. Uh, gradually, I thought about it. and. Even after I wrote uh, my, some of my books, that they were just theoretical, completely theoretical, two of them. Then I started to think that 
we have to do something that students can understand it. And how could they do it? By just writing definition, definition theorem, and formulas, that's not going to work. We need to give them examples and real life examples. So when they we write some differential equation and say, what is this for? Okay, I have to be able to tell them, okay, it is for heat or for wave or whatever. I have to bring them one example so at least so they can get some feeling before they can go through the formulas and solve the problems. Otherwise, they solve the problem without understanding what they're doing. They're just putting one symbol here and one symbol there. So because of that, I had a book in advanced math in 2011 that I published. Then I decided that, first of all, some of the content, maybe I have to change it. And also, I want to change the format. That means I want to put examples and all that. Because of that, I started writing a book that is going to be published in, in the fall, in, possibly in August, with Dr. Indica. But then before that, for probability and statistics, that's my area. I had several books on that, but they were all theory for graduates and for references. I decided that I want to write something for our courses, especially and then nationwide and internationally. So I started writing this book, Probability Statistics and the Stochastic Processing. The reason I put the stochastic processing was that the, the complete application of everything that I say in probability and statistics. In probability and statistics, we put some examples, we draw and all that. In fact, I included some of MATLAB programs in it so a student can go and practice for themselves so they can see how I can get, get this graph or that, not just showing them this is the graph. Okay, now this is the next graph. Or why? What's the difference? Go and do it yourself. MATLAB, especially on our campus, is free so they can go and uh, uh, upload it in their, uh, their computer and get it done. So because of that, I emphasize on the application. So most of this, I started from very basic sets that is a basic of mathematics, what the set is. And, and then, in fact, I included some fuzzy uh, sets that uh, about, uh, about three decades ago, uh, it was, came out from Berkeley, uh, Zade brought it, that is brand new. So I put that in there, and then I put some application of that so a student can see that in case that they want it. But other than that, that was the basic. So I started from very basic uh, uh, definitions of uh, some of the basic probability, and then moved on to statistics, and then moved on to application. Uh, that was the structure of this. And as I said, I similar to this one, but more application, I put that in the new book that's coming up uh, in, in the fall. Uh, in that one, that is for uh, also uh, higher mathematics for scientists and statisticians uh, and scientists. So for that, I put more application, a lot of application for engineer from engineering and physics and chemistry and uh, uh, biology, business, everything. I put it in there so that so that from any uh, area that they take that course, they can have some sample of that. That was the book about the general. In 2004, I was invited to go to Bulgaria for some conference. I went there, and then I was talking to the dean of their mathematics. They have the mathematics sciences have their own college there. Mm -hmm. And then they had the general there for 16 years when the Communist Party was there and all that. After that, they had stopped it. After they changed the system, uh, and it was not communist. They stopped the general. They asked me if I can take that one and continue with that one because I thought about it and then I said, okay, I'll do it with, the, with that dean together. We started together. And then after I did everything and all that, after two years, the first publication came out. So the first publication came out in 2006. And then gradually I learned how to do a better job and because I was doing it by myself. I had no help at all. So gradually, some folks, uh, like some of them sitting here, two of them sitting here, they help in some of the editing and all that, helping that for publication, uh, that Nihal and Prada and both of them. And so gradually came out, now it's 18 years now. And in some issues, we have two issues every year uh, in, in the uh, June and December. It's online, everything's online. And then everything now automatic. Uh, and then uh, to begin with, we had 
maybe five or six um, papers per issue, and then gradually went me to 45, and then I had to go down because I couldn't uh, continue like that. So I start to be much harder. I noticed some of the papers come with three, four pages of copying from other papers and all that. What's the use? What is, what's yours? What's the novelty in that? So I stopped that. So I filtered that, and now I'm going to maybe 10 or 15 papers per issue. Uh, a lot of them I've uh, rejected at the very beginning before even I send it for. Uh, it's a peer review. We send it for at least we have to, uh, two, at least uh, before we can uh, accept or reject it or send it for, re for review. So uh, it is the genre that is, thanks God for my colleagues that started uh, with me and then we automated uh, um, from the Elsevier that they're doing that uh, uh, automation and all that. So it's a I think it's a good journalist, international. With that, we put the name of PV on the world map, actually, right. because now everybody knows PV because they did, uh, led along the uh, Department of Mathematics. So it is well known. It's in Google. You can go there. It's there. And any place, you just put it in uh, American Mathematical Society, everything there. So with that, uh, these are the two. The journal is one side. That is on the book on side. But I have stopped to write in the book because it took me five years to write this book and the one is out. It, this one took three years for me with Dr. Indica. And the other one it took me two years with Dr. Mishef and Dr. Kumar from uh, Electric Engineering. So because of him, especially because his ideas of what type of examples, then I had to put it mathematically because engineering do it only with pictures and talking about it. I had to put the mathematics in it so that was the difference so it's i think that it's a good book and uh, again because i for these i could not publish my paper so i only one paper in this other than this book so i have stopped writing the book i'm going back to my publication i have i don't know i have uh, something like 60 papers or something although i was Department chair for 19 years, but I still could do those. <laughs> so, <laughs> he doesn't sleep. Uh, that, 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 no, that, I used that. to sleep three hours a night. After I stepped down from department chair, now I sleep about six hours. My, <laughs> my doctor has given me some medicine, so I push me to, to sleep. So, so, so that, that's the story of the book. Now, if you have a question. <laughs> so, there, there is one thing that um, I heard you say, and, and following up with Dr. Goodwin when you talked about integrity, when you said, in the journal, you don't accept them all because you were getting pieces that were simply copied from somewhere else. And I think with um, AI and chat GPT that's out, uh, I think we're all becoming more conscious of, of work that's, that we're seeing that doesn't belong mm. um, and that we have to make some decisions on what's you know ethically right. Um, and um, it's not an easy task to be an author, for sure. It's, it's time consuming. Um, I hope other people are, are listening when he said it took him multiple years to, to finish um, his, his book. Um, one of the things that, that I remember learning um, in school about mathematics is that you, you learn at three levels. One is concrete. And that's what our children know. And when you see the children using their fingers and all, they're still at a concrete level. They need to touch. They need man manipulatives. Um, and then we go to the semi-concrete. All those worksheets with the pictures that, that are handed out. Um, we assume when they come to college, they're at the abstract level, though. <laughs> and, and some of them are not. And so when Dr. Hagigi is saying that he had... Um, to determine what applications, um, to make those applications relevant to the students and their disciplines. Um, if, if a student is in geography and they are looking at a map, how does the math interface with that so that they can interpret what they see? Um, how does st statistics interpret um, with what they, if it's a, a student that's in kinesiology and they're doing blood pressure, you know, how are they looking at the mathematics of that? And so um, I'm, I'm happy to hear that the, you know, the applications were a very important part of, of developing yeah, Especially, book. let me just interrupt you. <laughs> especially, that we have had these, a lot of training for teaching recently. 
I have, I have three of those, <laughs> the, the three of those certificates. Uh, however, all of those emphasis in these courses that they train for faculty is teaching how you group, etc. I noticed that, okay, faculty have trained one time. Okay, now they're all trained. Then what? Students do. Are we able to do, the, to imply those first? That's one question, because some of them, it's not really possible. We cannot group them all the time and all that, because we have to finish the material, etc. for the next course. However, it's not only, the, the teaching is important, how to teach, but that's, as I said, I have taken three, because I want to learn. But students do not just understand it because the way that I teach, they don't understand the material. What is this for? As soon as you write even one square root of that quadratic equation, just, where am I using it? Exactly. My son is a physician. When he took uh, calculus in South Carolina, then he went to practice. I told him, okay, now you're in 20 years in practice. Where did you use that calculus? He said, never, ever. <laughs> <laughs> because they just give it to them, maybe because of thinking uh, correctly and all that. But we have to tell them what you're going to use it for. We have to tell them where you want to have, if you are in the process of, in, even in medical, you want to do research, you have to know the rate of something. Well, that's calculus. <laughs> we have to teach him then, uh, so that, or well, why differential equation, why partial differential You have to explain that to them via examples, not just another formula. That's the whole thing. I'm really against this definition, definition, theorem, definition, theorem. I'm completely against that. I have, for this book that I'm sending, some of in here, this book, I've deleted all the theorems. There is only one or two that are so famous that I had to put it. The rest of it, I just said that because of the fact of such and such, I do not do the, the theorem at all. So don't scare the student. Let them just give them the example. This example, because of the fact of such and such. So they can do it together. So that is the main thing that I have learned really that rather than just going to teaching methods, we do need to put the application of mathematics on the side, not to scare the students. Sure. Dr. Hagigi has been one of our troopers with the AQ program, um, faculty development in terms of uh, looking at the, the different strategies that um, faculty can use. And one of the things that AQ does though, it, it asks you to reflect on any strategy that you have implemented. So when you reflect on that, um, strategy, then you can decide, you know, was that really the strategy that I should use or should I tweak it um, a way that it would better fit? Um, the other thing in terms of um, the math classes, I always, um, when students ask, well, why am I taking college algebra? Mm -hmm. And it's not so much of just the college algebra. It is to get the students to think analytically about solving any type of equation or any type of problem. You know, if I start at Prairie View and I am going to, um, let's say Atlanta, um, would I go on 10 toward San Antonio? Um, I have to know how to make a good analytical decision to solve that, that problem. And so, the math classes not so much teach you all of those things. Like he said, he's pulled some of the theory out and said, let's look at the applications. Where does this application fit? How am I using this in my other disciplines to make sense? And so um, I thank you for, for, for that thank and you. for, for sure. your, you. your new book. Um, and for the students who are out there that don't want to do it by hand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we are going to go to a commercial break for a minute. Um, we will be right back.
Welcome back. Um, you are joining us for the PV Published Author Series with the College of Arts and Sciences. We have heard this morning from, or this afternoon, from Dr. Ronald Goodwin and Dr. Ali Bakbar Hagigi. And now we are about to hear from Dr. William Holston um, on some of his newly published work. And uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Before we get started, though, I want to acknowledge a couple people because since I've come here in 2019, I worked with a number of, of professors on campus and we've put together some edited work. So first, I really want to acknowledge Dr. Farrah Cambrice and Dr. Marco Robinson. We put this book together, Contemporary Debates in Social Justice, a great read. And then we, Dr. Uh, Cambrice and Dr. Uh, Foster and I put together the book, The Crucial Conversation, Educating Through an Anti-Racist Lens. And Dr. Foster was very instrumental in that book and putting things together. So I really want to just give them some recognition of some of the things that we've done uh, since arriving on campus. But the book that I'm talking about today is The Fight for Black Liberation, Breaking the Political Strings in the Post-Trump Era. Um, this book really started with my uh, exploration of wanting to talk to Black Republicans and Black Democrats and really get to the root of what was going on in America. Um, I wanted to really know why did Black Democrats continue to support the Democratic Party when I felt like they had neglected our interests. And then I wanted to know why so many Black Republicans had hopped on the Donald Trump bandwagon. So that kind of took on a life of its own. I worked on it for about six months. I wrote two chapters and then I scrapped it. Because in my mind, I said, why am I talking to black Republicans and black Democrats about why they're uh, supporting these parties? But what I should really be talking to them about is why don't we leave these parties and hold our vote captured and give it to a party that's going to best represent our interests? So one of the things that I'm arguing in this book is that we need to abstain from voting for one of these parties and hold our vote and only give it to the party that's going to best represent our interests. I'm not advocating on starting a third party, but more so I'm advocating on only giving it to a party that's going to introduce a black political agenda. So that's really the discourse of the book. Um, I interviewed a bunch of people through um, a lot of snowball clustering. I wanted to really talk to black Republicans. I know early on, I had talked to Dr. Foster to please introduce me to some black Republicans <laughs> who, who really considered themselves to be Republicans and wanted to talk in the open. You'd be surprised at how many people I actually reached out to that did not want to give me an interview. Um, I've known black Democrats all my life, and I've asked them repeatedly through surveys, what has the Democratic Party done for black people? And a lot of things are incremental, but none of it is really comprehensive. Um, we all fell in love with Obama in 04 and 08, but then I challenged some of the things that in which he did in office, and I concluded that he was not the black messiah that we had thought he would be, but he did some things that were very beneficial for the black community. So in the book, I really chart for it. Uh, in chapter one, I really just build this argument about how we switched between the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. And in the 60s, we were left with being in the threshold of the Democratic Party and what have they done for us thus far. But I really argue that the black politicians that positioned themselves during that time should have advocated for more. We know Jesse Jackson ad advocated for a lot. Um, we know that Al Sharpton advocated for a lot. But then I argue that they're bedfellows of the establishment. And because they're bedfellows of the establishment, the advocation only went so far. And then we had Obama who came and we believed that he was gonna move the needle to such an extent but that never really materialized in the grand scheme of things. Um, in chapter two, I kind of just pitted Donald Trump versus Barack Obama, but I centered Trump because I identified Trump as what we call the point of enlightenment. I argued that if we weren't gonna ever change anything when Donald Trump was president, when were we ever going to change anything? Have we had other points of enlightenment in our history? Of course we have. But I felt like Donald Trump was the end-all, be-all. If we weren't going to do it with him, 
were we ever going to collectively come together as black people and really move forward and create what I call a black liberation movement where we don't identify freedom as abstract, but something that is concrete for us with tangible requests, right? Very tangible requests. Um, in chapter three, I kind of really talked about this ideal of being progressive, right? But in being progressive, what do we really ask for on a black uh, agenda? Well, we know we need better health care. We need better education. Uh, we need more job opportunities. But we need to close the wealth gap, right? We need to talk about the warehousing of black people. So some of those things were addressed in that chapter. In chapter four, which is really controversial to a lot of people who have read the book, I said that we need to hop on the progressive train. Well, the progressive train is not realistic. Well, what other trains have we been passengers on throughout history that have been realistic and took us to where we really wanted to go? So at some point, we have to hop on one train and put our eggs in that basket and try to get to where we really want to go. Um, and then I kind of talked about how the election kind of weaved through the, the 2020 election kind of weaved through the ideals of what's going on in the country. But it showed us on face value that we are such a racist nation when January the 6th happened. What would have happened if black people would have stormed the Capitol and demanded that a certain person be in a position of power? Right. It kind of showed the fascism in our society, which really illuminates of who is representing black interests. Are white people going to always be in positions of power to be authoritative and supremacists in this country that want everything in their disposition? Right. So we really just went into that space. Um, in chapter six, I kind of talked about the ideal that after January 6th, Joe Biden wanted us to reconcile with a lot of unity. But unity, in my mind, is just black forgiveness. All we've done in our history is forgive white folks. So at some point, we can't forgive. We don't want to be hateful to war, but we want to recognize the type of society in which we live in. But in Chapter 7, which is really the culmination, I introduced this outline of these grandiose plans but one of the things I said, in order to really move toward a black liberation movement, the first thing we really should have is to restore our black consciousness. When are we going to restore our black consciousness? When am I going to look at you and you and says, what happens to black people in this country has everything to do with what happens to you and I in our everyday lives, right? So if I love you and I respect you and I honor you, even though we're not a monolithic group, I want to join forces with, with you to really move us ahead. Will we disagree on how we do it? Of course we will. But that dialogue really needs to happen. It really needs to be put forth. The second thing I said is we need to take back, rebuild, and build our communities. We have to do that. Unless we take back, rebuild, and build our communities, we could never be the type of community that we need to be as black folk. Well, how do we do that? Well, sometimes we need to rezone and create communities for ourselves. Um, you see a lot of private and suburban communities. They have what I call outsourcing and red zoning themselves. They're creating environments where no one else lives but them. How are they doing that? Raising the property tax raising the cost of the housing so only certain people can live in certain environments and only cater to certain groups of people. So how do we create spaces where we can thrive and flourish and be vibrant, vibrant but not feel the oppression and the racism that, and the prejudice that goes on every single day in Black people's lives? And the last thing I said is we just need to create some type of political independence. Um, we have to give our vote to the party that is going to best represent our interests. In a perfect world, it would be the Democratic Party. But only if prior to voting for them, they put executive orders in place, they put policies in place. Um, we know the candidates to whom are running. We put certain packs in place to fund those candidates. But we create the culture and foster the environment of American society that we believe that can really move black people forward. Um, we have to demand those things, you know, as the ancestor says, there's no progress without demands. 
So that's really the, the culmination of this book, The Five Black Liberation, Breaking the Political Strings in the Post-Trump Era. And now with Donald Trump winning in 2024, the book re even has even more reverence because we are going to see him have a strong push. Will he win? We don't know if he'll win. But to say that he no longer has an influence is very disingenuous to the landscape of what's going on. We can look at the media all day and say, well, Donald Trump is going to be convicted before the election. We know that the more sinister things that happen toward him, the stronger his base gets. Right. So that that's really the culmination of it. Wow. <laughs> I don't even know where to start. Dr. Dr. Goodwin, can you may, may start? Yeah, I, I know, he, he wants start. to start, but okay. White Post, if you know that Trump may uh, be reelected, you have to change the title of the book. When I first wrote the book, I <laughs> uh, was writing the book, he had just lost the election, which is why I really wanted to write it, because I wanted to know why Black Republicans were still following him. So one of the things that I did, and I don't really disclose this to a lot of people, is that I created a fake Twitter page. And I represented myself as a black male Republican. And what I started to do was I started to follow a bunch of black Republicans. And it's a totally different world. If your social media algorithm is not geared toward this, you won't see it. But if you go to this Twitter page, you will see the propaganda. You will see the grifters. You will see those who are traditional Republicans, but you will see everything from the Ruta to the Tuta of everybody <laughs> who is promoting Donald Trump. And you ask yourself, why do these black people love Donald Trump? So when I first put this together, it was post-Trump, but we're still in the post-Trump era. As I said, you can yeah. Only so the second time. edition of this book actually yeah. comes out at the end of the year because yeah. I'm adding to it. Good. <laughs> Where do you see the uh, institutions, whether it's schools and churches, mm -hmm. in the development of this enlightened black community? Well, I argue that, you know, one of the things that is happening now is the institution of the black church, I don't believe is doing their just due in terms of one, educating the masses as they once did. Um, a lot of these mega pastors are in the pockets of these politicians, so they don't use their pulpit to really do the things that they once did. Could they be more influential? Of course they could be. T.D. Jakes could, 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 shake, could shake, move the needle if he really wanted to. Um, with CRT and some of the things that are happening, it's very difficult for these schools to really leverage their weight as they once did. Um, I talk about that really in chapter three is that we don't have these activist teachers who really teach these kids about the landscape of what's really going on, right? Um, if you do that, then you may be removed from the classroom. There's certain literature that students aren't reading and there are certain things that teachers aren't teaching. When I send my son to school, one of the things that I t tell him is ask your teacher about X, Y, and Z. When we get to Black History Month, I don't want her just to tell you about the watered down version of MLK. I want you to tell my son MLK started school at 15. He created, he led a one day bus boycott when Edie Nixon called him um, that was supposed to last for one day, but lasted for 381 days. I tell him to ask her that, right? I want him to know that the bus boycott only ended because they lost 65% of their revenue, right? You need to know the real reason the boycott ended. It wasn't to give us rights. They were losing money. But they're never going to get that at school. They're never going to get that at school, but he's going to get that at home. He's going to get it at home. Right. right. But is that where he but should get it? That is where he should get it. But I believe that teachers need to be very transparent on some of these things, okay. right? And, and that's part of the, what I talk about in, the, in this chapter is that, you know, um, our public schools are inundated with white females and white females aren't haven't really been trained how to culturally educate black males and black women. Right. So he needs to know those things. When we're looking at his teachers for the year, I look at who's teaching him this year. He had a Prairie View graduate who was his teacher. I was elated. Right. So some of those things happen. But the, the numbers speak for themselves. We need more black male teachers in the schools. Right. 
right? No doubt. We need more black women teaching in the schools. We Maybe just, that's another book. But how do we get more black males? I believe in the academy from from K through right. sixteen, and to make sure that we have taught them yes. the history, because we yeah. have a generation now mm -hmm. that really doesn't know the history right. when they get to those schools. So it's great that True. he has a PV grad mm -hmm. as his teacher, but does she does she know correct the history that right. that needs mm -hmm. to be taught? Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I think it's it's one of those things that we. Still, as parents, we still have to make sure that that we're doing. Um, you know, I've been enlightened just sitting here listening to all three of you this morning. I think we need to do more of getting a, a, having a space on this campus where we are sharing our scholarship and our intellectual. Um, we we just, you know, I, if we hadn't been here this morning, I would not have known the things that any any other three of you had done. And so I think we have to do a better job on this campus of, of sharing that. Um, I, I could just sit here and listen to it all day. So, uh, but it, it is powerful when you think about um, those, those uh, holes that are in our history um, and what the next generation, um, will they know anything? Correct. And so it has to be the responsibility of everybody you know, even the non-blacks, it has to be the responsibility. But I was wondering that if you tell your son, ask those questions from teacher, are you assuming that the teachers know the answers? I'm not assuming anything. So then because <laughs> then you sort of, uh, you, uh, you're going only one way, but no. the other side of it, you have to see that what type of uh, information those teachers have to relay to your son or any other person. Or maybe but, uh, if he asks, maybe maybe if you if he asks the teacher that, the teacher will see the need to go and find out. Are Bingo. they allowed to answer them? No, that's they may not be allowed. <laughs> that's, that's a good question. question. That's another question. But, but, yeah. but the culmination of this is I want him to be a seeker of knowledge. Right. right. Yes. That's yeah. what we're trying to get to. I want him to be a seeker of knowledge. That he so wants if, to know. If he asks you and you don't know, I don't want you to lie to him. I just want you to tell him you don't know. So when he comes Go back and out. asks, exactly, he comes back and asks me, I'm going to tell him your teacher may just not be educated in this particular subject matter. But I would hope that when you go home that day, you know this little black boy asked you a question that you didn't know the answer to. Because he's going to come back and ask you again, because that's just what kids do by nature. That you have that information. Now, I'm not expecting you to be versed on black history. But there are some nuggets that you need to know to move you forward when you're teaching black kids. All right. And many of the, the, the schools, like Black History Month, first of all, the shortest month, and the only thing they teach is MLK. Right. And, and you know, the history is so far from just MLK. But he's right. safe. That's, that's a safe conversation. Okay. Correct. Um, we don't get into the... the and it's only safe up to about 1965. Correct. Uh, they're not talking about his conversation on, on the Vietnam War. Right. right. And that's part of what I talked about in the book. Actually, in the preface, I talked about the promised land. Right. We've never got to that promised land. So when that, that type of language started materializing and talking about Vietnam, that's when Martin put himself in a very peculiar situation, right? So we know that. But we need to talk about those things. We need to identify that Martin wasn't the most loved person when he passed right. away. His right. rating was extremely low. Right. Um, we need to talk about when Martin passed away, the things that were happening on with the Nation of Islam and X and how X had really started to see life through a different lens, right? As William Cross said, he started to go through his five stages of blackness. You know, Do you, this, the College of Education teaches those students that are going to be teachers any of these materials that you're asking? That's a very good question. And that's one of the things that I often talk to students about when they tell me they want to be educated. So maybe you have to talk to the uh, College of Education, education. first. Oh, most Because definitely. they are the one. You have yeah, done. most definitely, and, and and that becomes a, a a sticky subject because those students have to pass a state approved test, right. and it's like any standardized test. Mm -hmm. In order to move forward, somebody else has said this is what you must know. 
So those teachers whose livelihoods are dependent upon you passing that standard, it becomes too easy to, I, I got to make sure you know this. Even though I know you need to know outside the box, we may not have enough time to get But it, it's so important to find, it is, the, to it, find the time. Even if it's outside of the classroom, um, when our students leave here, we mm -hmm. want them to not just be competitive in that classroom, but to, to know really the things like that your son needs to know, right. you know, or my grandson needs to know when they go in those classrooms. It's there yeah. and, and they need it. Yeah. But I almost think it's unfair to place someone's livelihood in jeopardy <clears throat> because a third grader or a fifth grader can pass a test. Yeah. And but also we have to see that if the students are really or teachers are really interested to know. Some years ago <laughs> they had a, a statistic that they asked uh, all American they didn't know the name of vice president at right. that time. So sometimes people don't care. So uh, it may not be enough to just talk to college of education. It has to go higher level to to so that for the, the test that they have to do, they have to have some elements of these material in there. So that gives you the uh, 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 student and teachers here teach those materials. Right. Otherwise, that's what I'm saying, that they don't have really time for that. Right. But that's kind of what we did in the book, The Crucial Conversation, Educating Through an Anti-Racist Lens. We, we wanted teachers to reprogram how they went about disseminating information in the classroom, right? When George Floyd died, it, it led to a global movement, right? Mm -hmm. It made people say, I really just want to learn about race and racism. We don't know how genuine it was, but we know now it wasn't as genuine as we assumed it to be. Right. But when the corporations got involved, the money was being lost, there was this, this landscape of people wanting to not only re-educate themselves, but better understand what was going on in the landscape of American society, particularly as it dealt with race and racism. So that's one of the things that we talked about in the book. What are teachers doing in the classroom to introduce these topics in such a way where they're educating these students? And I think a lot of teachers had to go back to the drawing board. What am I adding to my syllabi? Do I have the right books in my syllabi? How am I disseminating this information? How do I even broach a subject of race if I'm not black or Hispanic or of another race? So some of those things are fair questions. Being a black male educator, being a black female educator, being a black male educator, we don't always know how to introduce some of these subjects too. We don't always know how to approach them as well. I think this is an open discussion that we all can have and we can continue to learn from each other. And I think that's, that is the centerpiece to all of this. Where, I think where, that's what Dr. Foster recommended. Mm -hmm. I think if we have more of this type of uh, um, meeting or something of dialogue, that sort, yeah. that dialogue, that will help. I think that is maybe she can start creating that because <laughs> that would really help. Because that's where <laughs> more work. More work. Yeah. 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 Maybe something like those Thanks coffee hours, <laughs> something like those coffee, coffee hours, hours you have. That is true. The coffee that is hours true. you can okay. uh, change it to this type of uh, well, uh, we really dialogue have nice instead of having only just the coffee. <laughs> Some good conversation. And then the one thing with the book, The Crucial, Crucial Conversation, we had people from multiple disciplines. And they talked about, you know, how would they um, infuse this in their, their classroom? And it was interesting to see. Um, and we had um, different races that submitted work to the book. Um, but it was really interesting to, to read how some... Uh, were questioning at the beginning, how, how would they put, like you said, they didn't really know how to infuse that material into their classroom. They had to go back to the drawing board. One in particular, I can remember, um, thought they knew exactly what to do and then realized that that wasn't working. And so when they got ready to write about it, they had to go back to the drawing board. So, yeah. Do we have any Good questions stuff. from the audience that, that I could? Yeah. I 
so since you're running for the city council here in the city, I would start locally um, with the city of Prairie View and with Waller County and take an evaluation of where does this city, this county sit in terms of how the black community lives? What are the things that this black community needs? Because that's the community that you represent and serve. So before you know, we, we, you, you take it broader, what do the folks here need? And when I say here, not just the students at Prairie View, but those folks who live in the community. Because there's a disconnect, somewhat challenge, maybe disconnect is not the right word. The feeling that the Prairie View students are not going to be permanent residents here. Right. So everything in the city should not be geared towards a population that is basically transient. So a lot of politicians spend an enormous amount of time on this campus, but not to the black community on the other side of US 290. So I can appreciate you being here and getting the students involved, but what conversations have you had with the folks who own land and property? They're the ones, because chances are they're not going anywhere. Now, hopefully we get students that come through, some may stay locally, some may not, and that's fine. They need to be involved politically and understand what their vote mean and how best to use that vote. They need that because they're learning it maybe for the first time. So from my perspective, there's a lot of work involved in terms of as an elected official to educate those folks, but then to also serve the community as well. And then once that community is grounded and has what it needs, then you can go outside. Yeah, and if you're talking about bringing the, um, you know, the students on board, the students have to know what the city or Wally offers them. Uh, if they drive down University Drive now, um, they don't know that the, the city offers them anything in terms of staying here after they graduate. So if you're trying to get those students to vote, based on the fact that maybe they will stay here, you have to make, they have to know what's, what's being offered to them. So, yeah. Thank you, good luck. Other questions? She's bringing a microphone to you. No, two. I'm a very proud Prairie View alumni. I have three degrees from Prairie View, physics, chemical engineering, my master's in engineering. And I'm proud to be a teacher here now, many years later in physics. As an HBCU, we shouldn't be limited by what month we celebrate black history. What are some suggestions might you have? I have some ideas, but what are some suggestions that you have in which we can celebrate black history across different disciplines in our curriculum so we can remind our students of the incredible contributions that are too often forgotten about as we teach our day-to-day. -day. Well, I, I don't celebrate black history during black history. Month. <laughs> <laughs> That's first and foremost. <laughs> but one of the things that I would encourage you to do is to first remind your students they don't know everything about black history that let's just start with that first um, oftentimes i'm in conversations with black students and they think they know but they don't know okay the second thing i would do is if you have a syllabi and you're a teacher try to infuse some topic strand per month as you teach that course it can't be every week if it's not a natural fit you teach physics right but in some ways, try to introduce them to innovators, things of that nature. And it would just be a very organic fit as you as you go forward. Right. Um, one of the things I, I do with my son, I, I know we keep going back to this. Who invented the super summer? Uh, who invented the potato chip? 
Uh, who invented the elevator shaft? You know, those are things that I'm continuously on him about because I just want him to know so he could be present every day. Every day you walk this earth, you can know that a black person contributed to that. So that's part of it. So my advice to you would be try to make it as organic as possible. You know, don't force fit. If it doesn't fit, it just doesn't fit, right? Um, but if it can fit, you need to know it can fit. But a lot of research is going to have to be done on your part as well. So I know um, several years ago, I was working with a project at West Point, the military academy. And there was a professor there. As a matter of fact, I think he may, may have been chair of the math department at the time. And every day he went in class, he said he took three minutes to just do a snippet of something like um, what, what you're talking about. He said it didn't really take a lot out of, his, out of the class, but it was educating his students on something other than the mathematics. And it was important. And it may have been related to the mathematics, but it was something that um, just enhanced the student. Okay. Um, with that, we are going to commercial break again. Again, thank each of you. Um, this has I'm been wonderful. Back, well, uh, we'll let them tell us. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. This is Caleb Carter from KPVU TV, and as you can see, we're here at the White House. And let me tell you, today was an amazing experience. It was a momentous occasion for over 30 HBCU student journalists who were selected to come to the nation's capital and participate in a White House briefing this past weekend. Students were able to meet a number of dignitaries such as Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms and Vice President Kamala Harris. A conversation that allowed for students to ask a variety of questions from HBCU funding to climate change. But before the journalists went back to their respective schools, Vice President Harris left them with one message. And so use your voices. Continue to use your voices. Because we need you. And we need you to also talk about things like climate, right? Starting a small business. A message that left the students feeling inspired and grateful. Being here today was just so surreal. Being in the atmosphere of the White House with other HBCU students and colleges representing. Um, I'm more than grateful for this opportunity. An experience like none other. Giving HBCUs that much needed exposure that they so greatly deserve. From KPVU TV, this is Caleb Carter. We're here at the Chevron Championship in the Woodlands, LPGA Professional Tournament, Women's Golf, where Prairie View will be broadcasting from what we call the Inspiration Dome, brought to you by Chevron, Accenture, and Prairie View. Uh, I'm excited that we were able to bring 40 of our students here to this um, amazing space to exercise their uh, experience in broadcast, as well as get to know the game of golf and how it connects to HBCUs my role today is everything um, talent, just interviewing players, and being a part of the tech crews, just making sure everything goes smoothly for our production. Having our emblem and everything rep representing the HBCU here is, is everything. Hello, my name is Caleb Carter. And I'm Keyshawn Gross. And we're here from HBCU today, and it is a great experience to be able to talk to Mr. Tip Harris and Mr. Vernell Woods from Moolah Wireless and kind of get their insight as to why they've been partnered with HBCUs. Yes, and along with HBCU today, we're starting here at Prairie View so that we can really captivate the culture and what they're doing with our communities and for our communities. Hi, my name is Kelsey Brown. I'm a senior here at Prairie View a &M University. So today we have our special guest, T.I., which is really exciting. And working behind the scenes is really fun too. We get to learn a lot about the tech side, the sound, 
the graphics, the lights, all the above, and it's fine. HBCU Today's goal is primarily to showcase what HBCU students are doing in their communities. So many times the spaces are not um, talked about because they are not cared about. So with highlight, having a show that highlights what HBCUs are doing really gets people in the midst of what's happening and so we can have people care a little bit more. It also gives us as working professionals a chance to be a professional, to carry ourselves correctly, to get the footage, to do all the things that a professional does. So thank you to Propel and a special thank you to Professor Dalvest. We're here at the Chevron Championship in the Woodlands, LPGA Professional Tournament, Women's Golf, where Prairie View will be broadcasting from what we call the Inspiration Dome, brought to you by Chevron, Accenture, and Prairie View. Uh, I'm excited that we were able to bring 40 of our students here to this um, amazing space to exercise their uh, experience in broadcast, as well as get to know the game of golf and how it connects to HBCUs in particular. My role today is everything. Um, talent, just interviewing players and being a part of the tech crews, just making sure everything goes smoothly for our production. Having our emblem and everything rep representing the HBCU here is, is everything. Welcome back. We are so glad that you joined us for the second half of our book review today. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us, you are watching uh, the book review that features PV published authors. And this month for this review, we are featuring authors from the Marvin and June Samuel Brailsford uh, College of Arts and Sciences. And we have with us for the second half of our show today, we have Dr. Nathan Mitchell, our, one of our wonderful political science professors. And we also have Dr. Quincy Moore, who's the director of our honors program. And they are with us this afternoon to talk about their chapter in a book that you heard about in the first half in the crucial conversation. The title of their chapter is Humanizing the Impact of COVID-19 on college students at a regional HBCU. So I will open up the floor uh, for them to discuss their chapter in this wonderful book. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if, you if you rewind back to 2020 or even to 2019, when you started to hear about these viruses out there you know, starting to uh, infect people, and early in the 2020, uh, January, February, by March 2020, uh, who had issued a, a pandemic. Uh, and so that meant spring break lasted a long time. Right. Spring break actually went to not coming back to school, to not coming back to school, to virtual learning, mm -hmm. all within one announcement. And so in the fall, or, or toward, toward August, the vice president of research, Dr. McGuess, actually issued out a I said a rapid rapid grant proposal to actually study the impact of COVID-19. And so Nathan and my, myself, we actually, we, we talked and we want to see the true impact that COVID-19 has had on the college population, especially the minority population. But we've seen a lot of things on the news and we, you know, from March until August, it was great devastation. And so, but really how are our students really in, in impact? And that really kicked off the start of uh, this work that we have in this book here. 
One of the important things to note is that um, the research that had been done up until the point where we got the grant had been focused on PWI institutions. And so we saw a lot of discussions in popular media and also in the um, scholarly literature that says that students were extremely risk taking and um, and what we were reading was, was not what our students were going through. Um, also, uh, when you look at the data from who was being impacted the most from, from COVID, it, it was and, and Latino students. And so we wanted to not just know about the raw numbers, but we really wanted to know that story so that we could better adapt what we're doing in the classroom to make sure that our students were getting the best uh, possible. So to even start this, uh, the research, we develop a tool to ask questions uh, to the students to figure out, get more insight on how truly the impact of COVID-19 really was happening to them. Um, from a question survey to even oral uh, histories, or I guess it oral interviews, to where we can actually get the students to, to open up and to talk about their journey through COVID-19. Um, I mean, it was, we sent out a survey to the entire campus, the entire campus, um, and our data is based on a small percentage, okay. but we, we feel that the data that we did collect was very impactful and insightful for what was happening within our campus community. Um, we've been able to dissect the true nature of a virus based on from mental, physical, emotional, and, and just even financial uh, impact of COVID-19. And the, the study actually allowed us to look at from within the book chapter, we looked at uh, questions, challenges from communicating with their peers, uh, being in contact with their professor, challenges challenges that group work who was in a virtual environment, um, keeping track of the due dates, the feelings of depression, feelings of isolation, maintaining focus, internet of technology. We, start, we can just stop right there and have a whole conversation, a whole conversation. about uh, were we prepared for the use of technology as the only source of learning, communication, and we realized that was a huge area. Uh, if you look at over just society itself, when everybody had to go to a virtual platform, technology was the biggest, uh, one of the biggest problems mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of households that didn't have computers. Right, or internet. Internet. But it was also an issue with students who had to share internet because many of our um, students also have um, brothers and sisters or extended family at home. And since they were not going to school during COVID, they had got additional um, responsibilities as uh, babysitters. And so um, our students had to navigate doing their own work with also sharing those re scarce resources with um, their families. And sometimes you may only have one computer in the house. And, uh, you know, you have to budget that. And that was really a difficult challenge for many of our students. Time management was an area as well. Um, learning how to juggle everything online. Um, that was a true. All right. And as uh, Dr. Mitchell talked about, juggling between your responsibilities of your schoolwork, now you got homework. You're, you're focused on what well, about the job market. Mm -hmm. Some occupations were direct contact mm -hmm. to where you had, in some places, you were not allowed to come back to work. Um, Pew, uh, one of the Pew research uh, indicated during this time that 44% of African Americans reported wage losses and 61% of La Latinos uh, reported wage losses during COVID. So um, this, indir this indirectly infected our students uh, because their parents uh, lost wages, but then also they didn't have an opportunity to uh, go work outside the house, which many of them typically did to help subsidize their education. So that was, that was a challenge. Um, another thing that we noticed is that uh, because of COVID, a lot of our students changed 
some of the things that they had been planning. So study abroad, go into internships or co-ops. Um, I was talking to a colleague in um, architecture, all their co-ops had been canceled because of COVID. And so a lot of these students had to scramble to get credits, but also the needed expertise so that when they graduate, they can go get a job. Yeah. It was uh, also insightful to see that, uh, you talk about internships, imagine students having summer plans and all the summer plans were just taken away. Um, just went from having options to no, no options. options. And during 2020, when COVID at its highest peak, a lot of our students face people dying in their lives, um, family deaths. So you're not only forced in the isolation place, but now you lost loved ones. Um, and so even from the comments, people in my family have died, uh, that were facing depression and isolation, anxiety. It's been a lot. I mean, these are true testaments from our students. Um, the data show that 37% of our students or our respondents uh, had lost somebody because of COVID. So think about it, one third of our student body lost somebody. And so when they're coming back to campus, they're not only dealing with, you know, just the shock of trying to get reintroduced and get back to learning, but they're dealing with that grief too. And so I think it's important, at least these data show, that I think it's important for us faculty members to understand that our students are still dealing with these issues and, you know, come up with ways to, you know, increase that belonging. Yeah. Motivation. Think about motivation as it relates to uh, being in this place, in this virtual place. Uh, in our respondents, 47% of the students uh, have motivation as a challenge. I can imagine. Yeah, so it's, uh, and it, as for, from a professor mm -hmm. standpoint, teaching in this environment uh, to where you're looking into the screen, like we're looking <laughs> at this, looking at the box right now, you know, this is that connection, the lack yeah. of connection with your students to know if they're co connecting with their information or they're just sitting there waiting for a time to elapse so they can move on mm -hmm. to the next thing. Uh, so not your academic performances. For some students, it declined. Uh, for some students, they're able to adapt to the new normal, as we say, right. and were successful. But for many students, it calls for a delay in graduation uh, or even a change of major. It's interesting that you bring that up because I have some notes and okay. some things that you all have mentioned that I'm wondering if our audience, you know, is thinking about. And also things that you all may have touched on um, as you were doing this research. One of the things that you talked about was... Um, students having to share internet. And it makes me wonder, what kind of feedback did you get from students or did your research show about the impact that COVID had on our students' boundaries? Um, personal boundaries, emotional boundaries, these relationship boundaries that for a lot of our students may have been firmly intact due to distance with family members or difficult situations at home or difficult situations even among their peers on campus, but they were able to establish some decent boundaries because there was a physical distance between them and that situation or that group or that person. But as you mentioned with COVID, a lot of our students were forced into their home spaces where they may have now been face-to-face -face or, or uh, with that situation of that individual and those boundaries may have dissolved. So did you all see any feedback or hear any things or did your research talk at all about, uh, well, I know it did, but how, talk to us about how your research kind of talked about that impact. So our students are still very connected to their families um, as a support network, not just financial, but also social. And it was uh, more so that because they were afraid of getting out to infect potentially somebody that had with mm -hmm. um, that with COVID or something like that, that it made it worse. So it became much, they were much more isolated. And so you, they reported a lot of mental health issues because they couldn't access that, that social network that they've had before. And so, um, whereas yes, you know, you, nobody wants to go home and live in their parents' house, but many of them chose not to even go home because mom, uh, 
uh, one of the students had an internship in DC that was also during this. Her mom said, don't come home. Don't come home. I don't want to get COVID, that kind of thing. And that scarring that you can't even go home to your safe place because you're afraid because somebody has a, a chronic illness or something. And then you have students who did not need the university to shut down uh, because they want to have the internet access because yeah. they went back home. Mm -hmm. uh, so they had to be here, had to be in this environment. And so they need the school to stay open so they can have access to the classwork. Um, so that, that was a dis disconnect for students. And then uh, even in my house, uh, four kids on the internet at the same time doing virtual. That's a strange. Or, that's a, I mean, that's, <laughs> or if the internet goes out mm -hmm. in the middle of class, middle of a test. So it's, that was, or that was a different variables that were not even accounted for. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it was a new, it was, you were thrown into it. It wasn't yeah. a time to adapt to it. And so we, we really see the impact of not having the choice, but this is your only option, mm -hmm. only option. Yeah. You talked a little bit about pivot mm -hmm. and how many students had to pivot in terms of their career options, their choices to kind of get to uh, not just their degree, but to still have the same kinds of uh, professional and career related options that were out there. Had you seen at all in your research a pivot of the type where students may have changed their major because they took that time during COVID uh, and because, you know, it was a happy accident or a detour that ended up being a change in life choice or a change in major? Have you seen any of that? Um, Just personally, uh, uh, from advising students, uh, some students who were architecture majors couldn't make models because they were right. virtual. Uh, a lot of students were shifting to more of the core classes. That shift caused a extra time in graduation now yeah. because they they did not want to take courses that they needed to be in person to comprehend. Uh, so I, I, that was a tr true insight into uh, what really happens when the normal has changed. Yeah. It's a ripple effect. <laughs> I, uh, the data didn't really speak to the, the impact of maybe changing their grade, their uh, majors. Um, I think, you know, as teachers, we would have liked for them to take that time to explore a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of them were just trying to make it to the next, you know, mm -hmm. roadmap. So, you know, a little bit of success here builds a little bit of success later. Mm -hmm. And, uh, th you know, the, the struggles really came out. Um, Afterwards, you know, maybe they may have explored a little bit, um, but they did drop down to maybe four classes, whatever it took just to be full time. Because a lot of them, you know, when we're, they were able to go back to work, that's what they did. Um, I, I'm sure you heard this from peers, too, where they were on Zoom calls and the, the students were at work. Yeah. So many students, uh, I would say, took advantage of the virtual environment from <laughs> being at work and in class. Uh, being at the gym and in class, <laughs> being on the beach and in class, getting coffee and in class. <laughs> so it was uh, for some students, it was a great uh, environment for them to where they they maximize the opportunity. Uh, but for some, me, I can just attest to my my youngest. She cried every day. She cried. I mean, she uh, fourth grade or third grade when third grade was on. In a virtual re reality, yeah, she cried every day because she the pressure she felt like she was being left behind. Yeah. So if a third grader is doing it, and you know it's third grade, but imagine that's the I'm reading I'm gonna read this from a college student here. Um, I'm not just motivated overall, and the t teachers are realizing that we as students are struggling online with these classes, and they continue to add more work online to make up for the not in-person interactions we're having. And we feel overwhelmed. Not being in person and having to maintain everything on ourselves is stressful, as well as this new transition into adult life. Um, also, the data we're showing, 29% thought the online materials they were given were adequate 
because you know many of the faculty members were still learning how to yeah. do the online teaching. And then the, what scares me the most is 25% felt that they were learning what they needed to learn to be successful. Mm-hmm. So on 75% of the students, if you, you know, mm-hmm. do the math, we're not satisfied with what they were getting here. And that's scary. It's very scary. With that being said, two things. You touched on this collective grief among the student body, as well as the faculty staff, because everybody was kind of transitioning into a, a like you said, Dr. Moore, a, a new normal. Mm-hmm. What advice would you give our peers here on campus or those who may be watching at other HBCUs or other institutions about our responsibility and what, based on your research and your experiences, what should we be doing? Because like you said, Dr. Mitchell, that collective grief is still with us. It's part of the ether now um, for many of our students and staff and faculty. So I'll open that up. What do you all think? Want to go first? Um, What I've done and I've continued is uh, instituted a grace period. Mm -hmm. Um, The due date is the due date, but then about three days later, it absolutely has to be in or I won't take it. Um, The students like that so that they have some flexibility to, you know, life happens to all of us so they can they can still get the work done. Um, I know not everybody is as flexible as that, but, you know, that's one of the things that I've done. One of the things that uh, I decided to do was become certified uh, through AQ um, to gain ways of interactions for online teaching. Uh, to be able to, and it opened my eyes to the way I teach in person. It's totally different <laughs> when it's an <laughs> online platform. Mm-hmm. I, I can't teach the same way in person than when I'm on a Zoom call. So it's important for, it was important for me to realize that you have to connect with the students a different way. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's like you take extra steps. Uh, so that's going, and that continues now, even though we're in person. I still have online and online presence for the class to be able to have that additional support as if we're online uh, so that the students can find that success that they need. I also think that the COVID changed how we work. So instead of waiting for in-person meetings, we can do a Zoom call mm-hmm. with the student anywhere and help meet their needs uh, a little bit more efficiently. But then also, at least on my end, sometimes you, uh, uh, they want to contact you at any time. <laughs> Boundaries. <laughs> that doesn't exist in some ways. Yeah, so. it's hard to keep those when, you know, it's so easy sometimes to click a button and answer an email at 11 o'clock at night or respond. Mm-hmm. And then we remember, oh, yeah, I said I wasn't going to do that after 6 o'clock, but it's right there. And so, no, that makes total, I think we're, we're all kind of yeah. floating into that where things get blurred because you're right. We can reach out to one another electronically or drop a message in a chat or post something and then respond, uh, even if it's asynchronous. But I can imagine that um, we'll we'll continue to see. I do like how uh, now you can schedule emails to go out. Yeah. uh, Like at 8 o'clock in the morning. So (laughs) even though you might be working, not everybody else is working. um, One of the things from going starting the pandemic and having to go online, lectures were recorded. Uh, so even today in, in class this semester, I was able to pull some of those archive videos and add, add that a supplemental teaching. Uh, so the students in person are getting that lecture, but then they also they have the recording to go to. So that was one of the things through the pandemic that students had an opportunity to have a recording so they can go back and listen to the lecture, stop it, and make sure the concepts are learned. Uh, so I think that's one of those principles that we have to continue, uh, having additional resources so that the students are able to uh, continue learning uh, and not just get it in that one moment in class. Mm-hmm. And when they walk away, realize, oh, I needed to ask this question. But having that online presence, mm-hmm. success is going to happen for your class. I, I think that's spot on. Because that's one of those things that 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 gift of being online is that people can go back and they can watch it over and over and over again. And it opens up the playing field. It levels the playing field 
or a lot of our students who may not have the strongest auditory you know, skills and they may need that assistance because back in the day before we were doing more work online, we were telling students, ask your professor if you can record the lecture, if you know you're not the strongest note taker, or if you struggle with something like dysgraphia where handwriting and writing things out is literally, it's painstaking because you have to think way into writing each word, each letter and putting together the sentences. Um, So I agree that that's one of those leftovers and those things that we should embrace um, because it makes things a lot better for our students because in the professional world, they'll have access to training materials um, on demand that they'll have the ability to go back and watch and reread over and over again until they get it. So. I think one lesson that the uh, our COVID research has taught us and even just listening to students, some students don't want to go back to in person. They want to just do online learning. Um, and some students have transferred Mm -hmm. to go to a university that offered more online courses Mm -hmm. and even today students are asking is there online uh, resources available Mm -hmm. Uh, so I I think um, COVID-19's impact is changing the whole educational um, landscape to where universities have to start adding and adding (laughs) uh, online courses as well as face-to-face or hybrid courses Mm -hmm. Uh, because the market, the scholars that are coming are from different, uh, they've been through COVID. Yeah. They, they're going through a pandemic. So it's it's a different, it's a different mindset now. I agree. Totally different mindset. I have two children uh, who are now in middle school, but started the pandemic in elementary school. Mm. And so there was that transition for them, for their teachers. Everybody was moved to this online environment. But what it did for us as a family, especially for me as a parent, it opened up the curriculum in a new way because there was a level of transparency now because I can see what you're learning versus just the the, the calendar to see what's being covered each week. And I can go look at the teaks and things like that. But now I can see it in Canvas. I can see it in your LMS. I can see all of the things. And now your classroom is in our home. So we can talk about the curriculum. And I think for our students here at Prairie View, it did much of the same. And for us as faculty, it kind of COVID forced us to rethink, how do I teach? And I'm so glad you mentioned AQ um, because both of you have been through (laughs) AQ and, you know, your outstanding faculty who love the art of teaching. And I think for us as faculty members, it opened us up to rethink, how am I instructing my students? Am I teaching? okay, but also are my students learning? learning? Because, you know, those two have to kind of go together. They're not always one in the same. So I appreciate you all's research um, and the hard work that you put into this at a very difficult time right. that you would um, be so metacognitive about the process. <laughs> and, and, you know, how is this affecting all, all of us? Wow. Uh, are there any other things you want to share um, from your research or just thoughts or recommendations based on what you've learned? Um, outside of the just the general topic, uh, when we did the oral interviews, we actually used honor students to engage in some mm-hmm. of the research. So they actually went and interviewed the other students and did the recordings yeah. and helped uh, help with some of the transcription. So uh, I think including this high impact practice not only helped to strengthen what we were doing, but the students were able to get uh, some additional deeper learning. And uh, some of our students still talk about what they they got out of it. Um, One of our students, and we're very proud of, um, uh, was able to add in a couple of questions about voting. And she presented it at a national conference and is a PhD student at Rice now, and starting her second year um, off of this, this project. And so I think that's also important. The second thing is, is um, uh, underrepresented communities during this time, lots of policies were being made about them and how to mitigate COVID without including them in the conversation. I think what this research does is it, it includes our students in the conversation about what it would take to mitigate or uh, ameliorate some of the impacts they have. One student uh, said that the pandemic encouraged uh, them to vote even more. 
like they felt like the country was in turmoil and that their their right to vote could lead to a leadership change that was needed for the country. Uh, so we saw more more students going to vote um, and one vote by mail, but wanted to go in so they can cast their vote. Yes. That is a perfect tie-in to what Dr. Hostin was talking about and what the group before our break was talking about in terms of having a voice and using yeah. that voice. Wonderful. Um, and there's so much, I think, that based on you all's research that we still have yet to learn. Oh, yes. I think it's ongoing, so I look forward to part two of, <laughs> of you all's work. <laughs> because you all have, have opened up, I think, uh, you know, such a, a broad... Uh, perspective on all the different ways that COVID has impacted and will continue to impact. And I really appreciate the fact that you pulled out all the, the entire spectrum from the things that were challenges, but also the triumphs that occurred, you know, because of the pandemic. So I hope that you all will think about continuing and then come back and then, you know, when that research is done, I'm putting that out there uh, <laughs> because there's so much to do because you all have established this baseline in terms of what it was like then. But just like your PhD student at Rice, there's so many good things that are coming out of, you know, the students that you've uh, talked to and interviewed, but also the students that we have here on campus. And I hope you'll come back uh, and make some more recommendations about what we should be doing because even though the emergency part of the pandemic has come to a close, there's so much more of an impact that will go on just like the Spanish flu for a generation uh, because of our two years spent inside and kind of cloistered. Um, so I, I appreciate uh, you all's research and I know we all do. We wanna see if there are any questions from my audience, or if there were any online. How do you lead the age of students? They didn't have the idea of learning about them for two years. How do we re-engage them across disciplines now that they're back face to face? Uh, I'm noticing that attendance is much lower than before. I don't know if it's related to COVID, but I to re-engage um, how do we re-engage our students in this uh, this climate now uh, is first recognize them as you know a person to be honest and to know that they have they've gone through a lot some students started college with the pandemic. Um, some students came in the pandemic. Um, so it's it's just being more. I, I, I want to lower your standards of teaching, but more be more. Uh, I guess transparent with them, as far as let them know that you're you're going through this. I'm going through this as well, and and just keep that in mind. Um, we one of the issues of, I think a lot of students had was when they were online, they felt like professors would needed to get them more work because they weren't in person. Um, I, I don't say take away the work, but I say take take away the method of how you give the work. Uh, be more creative in your delivery, and also, you know, as Dr. Mitchell said, sometimes you need that soft deadline and then that hard deadline. Because uh, some things happen. Uh, we know we don't want students to wait if a deadline is May 1st. We don't want them to wait to May 1st to do to start the work. But just uh, create that culture to where they understand that the deadline means you work before you get there. And, they, and have that little, little cushion for the extended time. I think that we need to give students multiple ways to learn and the material and also um, show that they've mastered the material. So um, I think for us faculty, we have to get out of our box a little bit about what's acceptable. Um, one of the things that I've started to add is a creative project that if you can apply the concept some sort of creative way, a video, a music, poetry, something like that, that can 
correctly convey the material, I'm okay with that for the final project. And they love it because this is a way to engage them. Um, also, I think that we need to increase the wow factor. What about our classes keeps them coming back? What about our classes keeps them engaged and engage with each other? They come to an HBCU for a reason. And I think that we need to build a little bit of that back in our classes, that that community is important, they're important, and that relationship with us is important. I don't know how to effectively do that. I'm still learning every day, but um, you know, breaking out, breaking out of your boundaries a little bit really does get some leverage. Help with you, who you can. Nobody comes to college to fail out, um, but uh, do your best. I know you're going to do fine. You can also get to know the students. Uh, who they are. Yeah, get to know them beyond just enrolled in my class, but who is enrolling in class? Um, I know it takes a little extra time, but the fact you get to know your students allows you to have that relationship to them with them that will encourage learning. Uh, that'd be very important. Thank you both. Thank you. Um, we are excited about this series. We're excited that you joined us today, Dr. Smith, Joe, and Moore, uh, to talk about your chapter. We want to also thank Dr. Ronald Goodwin, Dr. Ali Akbar Hagigi, and Dr. William Hostin, who were here with us today. And as we segue into the conclusion of our program today, uh, we want to remind you all that we do have several opportunities for faculty to continue to write, to continue to engage and share. Upcoming is our 30th annual HBCU Faculty Development Network Conference. It will be held in Houston, Texas, and the call for proposals opened yesterday. And the deadline for submission is August 15th, 2023 at 11 59 p.m. <laughs> so you have uh, a few months to collaborate and, and think about how you want to share uh, as we talk about community and empowering one another and lifting each other up and supporting one another. Uh, this is one of the conferences to do that uh, because we have shared experiences just like stories from the pandemic. We have stories from research, stories from classrooms. We need to talk more about telling our stories um, and how we are going to be innovative in moving forward. Um, as a collective group in higher education. And so with that being said, we will continue as the Center for Teaching Excellence to send out emails and let you know uh, what's going on on campus and across the country and the higher ed landscape. We thank you for joining us today. Uh, and please feel free to reach us in the center. You can call, you can email us, uh, and we appreciate your time. Thank you both for being here today. And that is all we have today. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you for having us.